Welcome back to part two of What Must I Do to Be Saved? Now, in my opinion, in the church world, generally speaking, there exists a lot of good teaching on, on matters like belief, faith, and confessing Jesus Christ. There's a lot of good teaching on the grace of Jesus Christ. And I'm speaking in the context of salvation. And obviously, there is perverse teaching out there, which is which is wrong, which is leading people away from Jesus Christ. But, but I'm just speaking about the matter in general terms. There's a lot of good teaching out there. I have learned a lot of good things from a lot of different people. However, notwithstanding all of this teaching, what we see in the church in general, in terms of people getting saved, is markedly different from what we see in the Bible. In other words, we have a lot of great theology, we know a lot of good things, but let's face it, we don't do much with it. Our level of knowledge is very high, but our level of obedience is very low. We just simply don't do what they did in the Bible. John 14 verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. When it comes to salvation, people have seemed so obsessed on so obsessed with knowing so much and not doing any works, the end result of that is that they have something which is different from what they had in Bible times. Now I'm talking again about salvation under the new covenant. I'm talking about what people did to be saved after Jesus died was buried, resurrected, and glorified, and then the Holy Spirit was given, and the New Testament, New Covenant period was ushered in. I'm talking about at the present time that we are in now. And what we are going to go on and see is what they did in the Bible when the gospel was preached unto them. This will surely be an eye-opener, I hope confess Jesus Christ to be saved? Yes. But what does it mean to confess Jesus? It simply means to say the same thing as to agree with, to assent to what Jesus said. Now, Jesus didn't just say John 3 verse 16 alone. Jesus said many other things. If we are going to confess Jesus Christ, we will say what Jesus says. 3 verse 1 there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from God for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him in verse 3 Jesus answered and said unto him verily verily I say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God Nicodemus saith unto him how can a man be born when he is old can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born verse 5 Jesus answered verily verily I say unto thee except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of God that which is born of the flesh is flesh that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, marvel not that I say, said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Why is John 3 verse 16 quoted ad infinitum, and the earlier verses in the very same chapter are never read out well almost never read out and if they're read out always the emphasis is given to john 3 verse 16 and not to anything else that jesus said it's not right the balance is wrong we are not getting biblical salvation it is abundantly clear we must be born of water and of the spirit jesus just told us ye must be born again now, I've got a couple of questions here, which perhaps you haven't thought of before in, in the context of everything that we're saying. Where do we go in the Bible to find out how people were saved under the terms of the Christian covenant, under the terms of the new covenant? 
Where do we go in the Bible to find out what people actually did in a practical sense? Everybody seems to know a lot of theology concerning the Word of God, but where do we find uh, where do we find in the Bible people actually responding to the Bible, and where do we see what they did in response to all of what Jesus taught in the Gospels? Where do we find the practical outworking of that teaching in people turned to God under the terms of the new covenant? and being saved. Have you ever thought about that before? Let's keep going. Where do we go in the Bible to find out what people did to be saved under the terms of the New Covenant? Do we go to the Old Testament? No, we don't go to the Old Testament to see what people did to be saved under the terms of the New Covenant. You just don't see it there anywhere. But the law contained in the Old Testament is our schoolmaster that brings us unto Christ. The Old Testament is good. The Old Testament is instructive. There are things in the Old Testament that are still in play today. For example, all the promises made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they have not been nullified or set aside in the least because of the coming of Christ and the uh, presentation of the new covenant. So we do learn a lot of fundamental things in the Old Testament that apply to the New Testament, but we don't see people there being saved under the terms of the New Covenant. Instead, we find the promise of the New Covenant. How about the four Gospels? As important as the four Gospels are, and that they point us to the way of salvation found in none other but Jesus Christ himself, which we must come un unto under the terms of the New Covenant, we still don't find people there being saved under the terms of the New Covenant because of what we read here in John 7 verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So while Jesus was on earth, tabernacling among men, the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, had not yet been given. It's very plain to see because this is what Jesus said himself. Jesus had not yet died. He had not yet uh, been buried. He had not yet been resurrected. He had not yet been glorified. The Holy Spirit had not yet been point, poured out. So we who are in the New Testament era, under the in the era of the New Covenant, we don't go to the four Gospels and say, this is what they did to be saved. No, let's keep going on. Someone will surely say, but hang on, what about the thief on the cross? He got saved. Uh, in Luke 23, verse 43, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. See, the Bible clearly teaches that the thief on the cross got saved because he merely confessed Jesus as Lord. Is this where we find an example of how to get saved under the new covenant? Let's think about this logically. No! The thief was still under the old covenant arrangement at that particular point. Jesus had not yet died. He was not yet risen again. He had not yet been glorified. The Holy Spirit had not yet been given. The new covenant had not yet been ushered in. This is a fact. It's so obvious it can't be ignored. We who are in the period of the new covenant now can't go to the thief on the cross and say, just because he did that, we can do the same and are saved. No. Furthermore, there is only one reference to the thief on the cross in the Bible. And it is unscriptural to build salvation doctrine, in fact any doctrine at all, based on a single witness. We should all know that we need at least two or three witnesses to establish a matter as fact. 
And when it comes to the thief on the cross, I'm sorry, there is only one witness. You and I cannot build out, build up a school of doctrine upon the thief of the cross, even though that has been done in the world. Even though there's this great body of teaching behind the thief on the cross as a way of salvation, as setting forth an example of how to get saved, it's not scriptural to do that. You need two or three witnesses. Then you've got a matter established as fact. And we don't have we don't have that standard. We don't have the Bible's own standard of proving a matter as fact by having two or three witnesses. In addition, none of us are the thief on the cross, nor will any one of us ever, ever be in such a situation. It is way out of line to put ourselves in the same position as the thief on the cross because we are not him. That is so obvious. We came, come later than the thief on the cross. We come, have come at a time when the Holy Spirit has now been poured out. Jesus has died, risen again, been glorified. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. The thief on the cross never had that set before him. And lastly, I just want to make one pass, one more passing comment on the thief of the cr cross. Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Where did Jesus go that day? I want to say something that might shock you. Jesus did not go to heaven that day. Read your Bibles. Where did Jesus go on that day? Now, I don't want to disparage the thief on the cross. I don't want to pronounce judgment on the thief of the cross. But I'm, I'm saying to each one of us, the thief on the cross is not an example to use to find out what people did to be saved under the terms of the new covenant. That is the bottom line. I hope that you don't take this the wrong way. Let's keep going on. Where do we go in the Old Testament to find out what people did practically speaking to be saved? Well, as others have pointed out, the Old Testament is preparation. The Gospels are manifestation. The book of Acts is propagation of the Gospel. The epistles are explanation of the Gospels, and the book of Revelation is consummation of all things. Where do we go to find out what people did, practically speaking, to get saved under the terms of the New Covenant? Of course, we go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts is commonly called the Acts of the Apostles. In reality, it is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And in that book, what we see, what people did in response to the preaching of the gospel. Read it and see. The book of Acts is not a setting forth of theology, although, of course, it does contain theology. But it is a setting forth of what people did when they believed. Believe is a doing. The book of Acts in the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit being poured out and we see the people's response to that spirit. In the book of Acts, we see what happened when the spirit of God moved upon them. We see whether or not they just had a good feeling, whether or not they just had a mental, mental affirmation, whether or not something just changed on the inside. We get to see what actually happened. Therefore... If we want to know what people did in everyday life when they got saved, we see that set forth plain as can be in the book of Acts. If you are going to show somebody what you actually need to do to be saved after you've expounded theology unto them, you would go to the book of Acts and say, thus and thus, read here, this is what they did. This is a wonderful thought. 
to me it's wonderful. And to me, when I when I contemplate this, I understand why what happens in the churches today does not look like what happened in Bible days. Because people are not following the Bible pattern on what you do to be saved. There's a lot of great teaching out there. There's a lot of great theology out there. There's no doubt about it. And I can be taught a lot of things, I'm sure, and so can you. I'm not denigrating for a minute the teaching and people's sincerity and their love for the Lord. I'm not. But the fact of the matter is, the Reformation that began with Martin Luther has not yet gone far enough. We have not yet rolled back fully back to Bible doctrine. A lot of things have improved, of course, since Martin Luther's time. But still, there is more work to be done so that we get back to the time when they turn the world upside down. When we get back to the time where Christianity was, a, is, was and is a living experience rather than just theology where you and I go to the go to church a couple of times a week, we're preached to and then we go home and we wonder where are the miracles? Where is the moving of the Spirit? We've got to start doing the works of the Lord. We've got to start imitating what has been, what is set before us and practically speaking, the book of Acts is a complete eye-opener if you're wondering what people did in in the New Testament era when they responded to the gospel. And we're going to go on now and look at that. We just read before in John 3, Ye must be born again, he saith to Nicodemus, Ye must be born of water and of the Spirit, or you won't see the kingdom of God. What does this mean practically? We go to Acts chapter 10, the story of Cornelius, as, as a great example of what someone did, of what people did when the gospel was preached unto them. Here in Acts chapter 10, we find a man called Cornelius that possessed at least seven fine qualities in the eyes of God. This is the scriptural record about this man Cornelius. This is just not what his neighbor thinks of him. This man Cornelius was quite a upright man. We are told he was a devout man. Uh, he was one that feared God. He was one that gave arms to the people. He prayed to God always. He received a vision from God. He was a just man and he prayed and he fasted. Now, if we had somebody like that walk into our midst, into the midst of the church, you know what would say? We, sorry, you know. We don't have to guess what happened to Cornelius for his salvation. Acts 10 verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. So the word was spoken. They believed the Holy Ghost fell upon them which heard the word and they of the circumcision were, which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because on, that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. This sounds exactly like what we read, what, what we can read about in Acts chapter 2. 
They were born of water and of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 tells us that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. Now many people stop and say to be born of water is simply to be washed by water, the water of the word. But that is only a part truth. Acts 10 shows us that as Peter spake the words, the words of life, as he spake the word, did it wash him? It sure did. The Holy Ghost fell upon them. The same gift that that the, uh, the disciples had in Acts chapter 2. How do they know that? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can any man forbid water that they should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he suggested to them that it might be a good idea to be baptized. No, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born of water and of the Spirit. Practically speaking, what happened to Cornelius, a devout man like Nicodemus, also a devout man? No doubt Nicodemus had great morals. He ran his household well, I'm sure, but he needed to be born again. Cornelius had a great standard. He loved the Lord, but he had to be saved. And to do that, the word was preached to him. He believed that word as they were hearing it, it came into them. And as it did, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. As the Holy Ghost fell upon them, it was like the wind blowing. You can't see it, but you can sure hear it. And I heard them speak with other tongues, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. It all happened the same day, the same hour. This is not salvation on the installment plan. This is like what happened to the children of Israel, delivered suddenly, instantaneously, with signs following. This is biblical salvation. Acts 11 verse 15 tells us, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. That looks back to Acts chapter 2. Verse 16, then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, that ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, for as much then as God gave them the light gift, as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Do we need to believe? Of course we need to believe. But what happens when we believe? The Holy Ghost falls upon us as at the beginning. It is the light gift on those who believe. You see, believing is a doing. It is not a mere mental affirmation. Belief is a matter of receiving the word of God, being washed by that word. And as we are washed, the Holy Spirit comes in. As the Holy Spirit comes in, it comes up from our belly, from our innermost being, comes out the Spirit of God, and we hear a manifestation of speaking in tongues. Jesus said to Nicodemus, John 3, verse 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Do we see this in action in the story of Cornelius? We have Christ teaching about salvation. And then in the story of Cornelius, we see and read with our own eyes what people did. What happened to them when the gospel was preached unto them? Was there a sound? When the Spirit of God moved upon Cornelius and his house, absolutely. And they came forth speaking in other tongues. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. We see in the book of Acts what happened when the gospel was preached to the unsaved. None of this is a surprise because Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, sets the precedent which was not changed. 
Acts 2 verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house wherewith they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There came a sound. That refers back to John chapter 3, verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and you can hear the sound thereof, but you don't know where it comes from. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You know, when a baby is born, if it doesn't make a sound, the doctors and the parents panic. When a baby is born, if there is no sound, you know, death is at work. The, bi the baby is either dead at that point or about to expire. The baby must be slapped on the bottom or whatever. It's got to scream out. A sound has to come out. And when it does, everybody in the room rejoices. Everybody in the room uh, is excited because that baby lives. And somehow I think that there are a lot of stillborn Christians. Uh, they've come part of the way, but they have not been born again. There's been no sound. There's been no infilling. There's been no new breath of life like what we have in the Bible. In Acts 2 verse 33, Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, this promise of the Holy Ghost, which ye now see and hear. There was something to see and something to hear, but, but how different it is when we go to the church service and the minister says, Say this prayer after me. Oh Lord Jesus, I believe on you. I accept you into my heart. Please save me. And wow, bam, suddenly you're saved and you receive the Holy Spirit. You don't see anything. You don't hear any blowing of the wind, any moving of the Spirit. It's just words. It's the words of the preacher. It is not biblical salvation. On the other hand, what we read about in the Bible is so evident that when it happens, you know that it's happened. It's not that you know that you know that you know. You know because you see and you hear something. What do you hear? What do you see and hear these days? Well, a lot of churches, it's a rock and roll concert. You see smoke. You see laser lights and all kinds of things dancing around. And it's somehow that this is the Holy Spirit. No, not on your life. You don't need smoke machines, loud music, rock and roll bands, fancy light. No, what, what the church needs is the real manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Not sinner's prayers, not somebody saying giving your heart to Jesus, not making a decision for Christ, but like what Peter did to Cornelius, he told him what he and all his household needed to do to be saved, and they did it. Back on the story of Cornelius in Acts 10 verse 45, on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know that? Did they tell the people to say the sinner's prayer? Give your heart to Jesus and be saved. Just simply now confess that Jesus is your Lord and you will be saved. How did they know that they had received the gift of the Holy Ghost? We don't have to guess. Verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Praise the Lord. Acts 2 verse 14, but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Well, they could hear this great racket going on. The Holy Spirit had blown in. 
He was speaking in other tongues. Verse 16, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. But what do we get in churches today when we talk, when we talk about the Pentecostal experience? That you need to receive, you need to be baptized, be baptized by the Holy Spirit, and you need to be baptized in water. Well, we're, we're told that this is not that. We are told that tongues is the least of the gifts besides I have love. Or another will say, uh, it's just for those days. These are the cessationalists. Say so it's all passed away. Other word, in other words, when that which is perfect is come, tongue shall cease. Not understanding what that means. So they say tongue shall cease. So we've got all this doctrine, this false doctrine around what is written in the Bible, denying the power thereof. From such turn away, brothers and sisters. What a contrast to the men and brethren of the day when they saw and heard what was going on and Peter preached to them. What did they do? How did they respond? Let's read. Verse 41, then they gladly received his word. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine if everybody was arguing, I believe already, I'm a disciple already, I don't need to do this. Nobody would have got added unto the church, but they gladly received his words. And not many gladly received the word today. Gladly received the word and were baptized. They were baptized the same day. And that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, bless the Lord. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. Well, did only a few speak in tongues? Did only a few have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Or did they have all things in common? Apparently, they had all things in common in verse 44. Praising God and having favour with all the people and the Lord, all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as would be saved. They gladly received his word. They that believed, there is that word again. We must believe in Jesus Christ to be saved. They that believe were gathered and had all things in common. We just read before that Peter said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Now I want to, now I want to give you an example of something that is not that. I have been reading a book written by a lady who is baptized in the Holy Ghost, praise the Lord. She's been baptized in water, praise the Lord. She's repented, praise the Lord. However, at the conclusion of her book, she uh, calls upon the reader to uh, be saved if they have not already done so, and that's a very commendable thought. Uh, I'm reading from her book, when you are obedient to do your part, the Lord is faithful to do his. If that is the desire of your heart, pray this prayer. And then she asked the reader to pray this prayer, which I'll put up here now. Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner and that I am powerless to change my heart. I believe that you are Lord and that you died for my sins and you were resurrected from the dead. I ask you now to forgive my sins. I turn my life over to you. I declare that you are my Lord and my Saviour. I love you, Jesus, and I surrender my life to you. Now, I've got no problem with the contents of that prayer, and I'm, I'm not criticizing that prayer in and of itself. But the author of this booklet that I'm reading then says this. The author says, if you have prayed this prayer from your heart, you are now born again. You have a new nature in Christ, etc., 
etc. This is not that which was spoken of by the prophets. This is not that which we read of in the book of Acts. This is not how people got saved in the Bible. This is a popular method that somehow has come about. I don't know how. Uh, it's perhaps, if we studied it, it's probably a more recent thing in terms of uh, church history. But this is not that. The writer of this book is a Christian. The writer of this book is well-meaning. But she is not saying that which is in the word of God. We don't read about Peter getting up on the day of Pentecost and saying, now repeat these words after me. The crowd repeats it and he says, hallelujah, you're now saved, you're born again. I hope that you can see that what we, ha what we see in the Bible is different from what we are getting taught by church leaders and church ministers. And something is wrong. Is the Bible wrong? Have people somehow improved on the mode and the method of being saved? No, they haven't. People have drifted away from the word of God. And we, we, you, me, and our children and their children's children have to get back to solid biblical teaching. We have to get back to apostolic Christianity uh, and turn this thing around because it's gone on long enough in the wrong direction and it's time to do that which we read of in the Bible. Praise the Lord. This is the end of part two of What Must I Do to be Saved?